Okay, I trust that you're all there at Philippians 3 verses 12 to 14 as we continue to press on to the goal, the goal of maturity in Christ's likeness this evening. Now, if anyone, if anyone ever could have thought that they had arrived in the Christian life, then surely it would have been the Apostle Paul. Don't you agree with me? <laughs> I mean, here was a man who had had numerous visions of the Lord. He'd met the Lord on the road to Damascus. He saw a vision of the glorious risen Lord Jesus Christ. He had been caught up into the third heaven. He'd seen things that no other living person had seen. And he had written some of the most profound theology ever penned. And yet Paul says, I need to keep on moving ahead. He hasn't arrived in his Christian life and he knows that he has to keep on going. In fact, you even see this in 2 Timothy chapter 4, which you know was his last letter before he was executed when he was in prison. And in this dungeon in Rome, we find him writing and asking Timothy to bring him his cloak or his coat and he adds the books, especially the parchments. Here he is, he's facing execution, and yet he wants his books because he wants to keep growing. Now, that single attitude of always moving ahead is what Paul is talking about here in Philippians 3, 12 to 14. You remember it has three parts to it. Last week we looked at the first one, which is forgetting what is behind, forgetting the past. Tonight we will be looking at the second one, which is straining forward in the present. And then we have pressing on. I press on towards the goal or the prize, which is then in the future. Brothers, I don't consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Now remember last week we saw that Paul speaks about forgetting the past. And you hopefully remember that we defined forgetting not as some sort of passive thing that happens to you, but an active thing that you do to choose to remember the past no more. In fact, in this week, somebody sent me the Afrikaans version um, of the, these verses, the, the Afrikaans translation, and it is amazing how beautifully the activity of that comes through. In the Afrikaans it says, Ek maak my los van wat achter Ek maak my los. In other words, I de deliberately choose to forget what is behind. And remember, Paul said we must forget not just the, the bad of the past, but also the good, all of our achievements, anything that would hold us back in our spiritual growth. We need to uh, leave behind us the good and the bad of the past and we need to leave it in God's omnipotent and redemptive hands and if we do that says Paul if we're no longer looking to the past instead we'll be able to run with our eyes focused on what is ahead and our no to the past to what is behind will then be a yes to the present and what lies at hand for us and it is this focus on the present that is so very important and that's what we're going to be looking at this evening. So the focus on the present is extremely important. Paul says, he puts it this way, one thing I do, and I remind you, hopefully in your Bibles you'll see that the I do is in italics and that just means that it's not really there in the original word that, that we, the, the translators have added the I do just to make it make sense in the English. But it's really quite a brief statement that the Apostle Paul makes here in order to emphasize his point. He says, but one thing. And then he adds a little word that intensifies it and, and that means indeed. In other words, Paul just says, but one thing indeed. And that one thing 
of Paul's implies a focused concentration and effort. It implies that Paul sets aside the distractions and works at keeping his mind and his heart focused on the goal of knowing Christ and becoming more like him. It means that Paul is assuming a runner's posture. And what is a runner's posture like? It's straining forward to win the race. A runner in a race can't afford to, to admire the scenery along the way or look at the people in the grandstands, the spectators, or look at the sidelines. Uh, Pastor Martin Roy jones put it this way, the man who runs in a race must not be interested in the landscape. If he begins to look at the mountains and the charm of the flowers in the hedge grows, he will not win the race. He must be intent on one thing only. You know for yourselves, uh, an Olympic champion. He or she is not a person of many interests who just dabbles in their sport once in a while when it's convenient to them. You're not going to win a gold medal at the Olympics like that. What does an Olympic athlete do? Every day they get up. They put their mind on the goal, which is to win gold. And they're always straining forward to reach the goal. Everything else in their lives, their social lives, their schedule, their diet even, takes a backseat to this overarching goal of, I'm going to win gold. This one thing I do. Now, when Paul talks about reaching forward to what lies ahead, obviously he has in mind the picture of a runner racing towards the finish line. So that's very much what's in mind here. Paul's body is bent forward. His eyes are fixed on the goal. And he's moving along the track or the path that God has laid out for him. And he leans forward as his feet carry him towards the finish line. And all of his energy, mental, emotional, and physical, is given to this race that he is running towards the goal of Christ-like maturity. Now, ladies, I'll be very honest here this evening. This morning when I got up, <laughs> and throughout the morning, in fact, through the morning I said to Carly, Carly, I've got to go tonight and tell these ladies to strain forward to what is ahead, and I feel like I'm crawling. <laughs> I'm crawling this morning. Now, maybe you are feeling like that this evening. And maybe like me, you daydreaming of days of leisure and rest and relaxation. But the Christian life is really a race, isn't it? In fact, it's a war to use another image that the Apostle Paul uses. And by God's grace, we have to do our best to run this race with and for Jesus. And to stay on course, we're going to need to ask ourselves some questions from time to time. Questions like, am I focusing my efforts to, towards the prize that awaits on the, at the end of this? On the eternal goal? Is that where my efforts are focused? Or am I focused perhaps a little bit too much on the year and now? Maybe I'm getting sidetracked by all kinds of temporary things. Or we need to ask ourselves, am I training regularly? And how do we train for the race of faith? Well, by working out in the daily disciplines of the Christian life and receiving God's grace and strength from Him to be able to run the race. Running the race or living for Christ and growing in His image requires focus and discipline. Rest and relaxation are important. Okay? We all need time to recharge our batteries. We need time to refocus our vision and our energies, to sharpen the blade of our lives, as it were. And I think that is why God has so graciously built into life 
for example, the fact that we have to sleep. And another thing is that he's built into the pattern of life the one day in seven rest day. For us, the Lord's day. Because he knows that we can't just keep going, 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 going. We do need some rest and, re and relaxation. In fact, I like the word that the older writers used to use. Recreation. We need recreation, which is recreation. <laughs> we need to be recreated. But what we must always be careful of is that we don't allow our desire to rest and relax and to reward ourselves to become the focus of our lives. I was thinking about that this afternoon and I thought to myself, you know, I think the, the problem we face today is that rather than using our recreation time to enable us to give us the strength we need to be able to serve God and others better, what we do is we put the cart before the horse. We serve, 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 serve and to get it out of the way so we can rest. And it's a subtle thing, isn't it? So instead of resting so that we can serve, what we do is we serve to get it out of the way so that we can rest. <laughs> and that's where our focus is very often. The question each of us needs to answer is, do I have the kind of single-mindedness about growing in the Lord? Do I devote myself to knowing Jesus, to being like Him, in the same way that an Olympic athlete devotes themselves to winning a race? Does knowing Christ and growing in Him consume me, or do I just dabble, it, dabble in it when it is convenient for me? You see, if you want to grow, if you want to know Christ, then you'll have to put your full effort into it. You can't just do it occasionally. In other words, you'll have to be a focused person, a focused woman. What characterizes a focused woman? What sets a focused woman apart from other women? Well, first of all, a focused woman knows where she is going. <laughs> she has a sense of God's call on her life. And that sense of God's call is what gives her direction for every other part of life, for each step of the way. It's what makes it easier for her to make all the other short-term decisions of her life. If you know what God's call is for your life, then you can fit in all the other things into that. She knows, therefore, how to say no <laughs> to the trivial things that, that sometimes distract her in order to follow God's goal for her life. And then secondly, a focused woman has greater energy for reaching her goals because she's not wasting energy on wandering aimlessly from option to option or wondering what to do. She knows exactly what she needs to do she knows what God will enable her to do. And so she focuses her attention and gives all of her energy to those things that God has called her to do. And that gives her confidence. It gives her energy. She knows where she's headed. She knows why she's headed that way. And so she does everything she does in a way that makes it count for the Lord. And it is this kind of focus that Paul is speaking about here when he speaks about straining towards what is ahead. But how will we get our focus right? Well, to get our focus right, we have to recognize God's purpose for us. We have to have a clear understanding of what God's purpose is for our lives. When we understand our purpose for being here, we'll know what to focus on won't we? Paul says, but I press on to take hold of that. So what is his focus? His focus is to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. In other words, 
His focus is on the purpose or the goal that Christ saved him for. And what is that purpose ultimately? Romans 8 verse 29 and Ephesians 2 verse 10. If you've been saved, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to, to what? To be conformed to the likeness of his Son. And in Ephesians 8 and 9 we read, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For, Ephesians 2 verse 10, we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do what? To do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. He prepared them in advance for us to do. He has a path that we need to run along. He has a track, a purpose for our lives. He saved you to make you like his son and to do the good works that he has given you to do. And so our purpose is to know and love and serve and glorify Jesus Christ. Now, we will have focus for our life if we recognize God's purpose for our life and then center our entire being on accomplishing that purpose. We mustn't allow ourselves to get tripped up or stalled or paralyzed by the past. But we must also not allow ourselves to get sidetracked in the present by all kinds of distractions. We need to put our minds on what God has called us to do and renounce the things of the present that distract us or that divert our attention away from pursuing Jesus. What kinds of things? Well, ladies, I really can trust the Holy Spirit to, to put his finger on the things in your life that are a distraction for you at the moment. But it could be things like your job, or your house, or any other position. It could be a relationship, a spouse, a child. Maybe you're so engrossed in pleasing your spouse or your child that it's become a distraction to your service of Jesus Christ. A hobby, <laughs> television, social media maybe some upcoming event, or even an anxiety or a burden that is gripping your heart at the moment. That can really become a distraction. It could really be anything. The point is, if it is distracting you away from Jesus, if it is hindering your pursuit of Him, Paul says, forget it. Put it out of your mind. Forgetting what lies behind, strain on, strain towards what is ahead. In other words, pursue Christ with maximum exertion, with every fiber of your being. Go hard after him. Strain forward. I think that same Afrikaans translation says, extract my eight. There's a, an idea of really stretching your muscles forward. Look at Paul's own statement of what straining forward meant for him. We find this in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, <clears throat> from verse 25. Paul says, everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last. Christine Mboma has really astounded us, hasn't she, with all her amazing achievements. But can I tell you a secret, ladies? First of all, that gold medal will not last. And second of all, neither will she. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, says Paul, I don't run like a man running aimlessly, no focus all over the place, and I don't fight like a man beating the air. I beat my body. And I make it my slave, so that after I've preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Do you see Paul's focus and his effort, his maximum effort there? 
With all the discipline and self-denial of an Olympic athlete, he's straining forward. And that's going to involve planning. It will involve setting goals for yourself in the areas of worship, study, prayer, witness. You know, ladies, these things don't just happen. You have to plan for these things to happen. Set goals for yourself. Set spiritual goals for yourself. And it will involve vigilant self-discipline of all of your life to achieve these goals. It, it involves maximum faith, maximum prayer, maximum effort, maximum perseverance. And it won't be easy, will it? Nothing worthwhile ever is. And that's even more true in our spiritual lives than it is in the, in, in the field of athletics or even in the field of academics. But while it won't be easy, it will be worth it. Because of the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus our Lord. And so Paul says, reach forward with all your might for that for which you have been grasped by Christ. Purpose is paramount. Knowing my purpose, knowing that I am here to give my life in service to God and His people, that's going to be a strong motivator for us in the race towards maturity in Jesus. Are you focused? Are you focused on the specific and yet grand purpose for your life? Can you also talk in terms of Paul's but one thing I do, the one thing I'm focusing on, under which everything else comes. Because if you can do that, then you can also say that by the grace of God, He has given me something eternally significant to do with my days here on earth. We're not running to win a crown that will, will fade away. We are running to serve our Master Jesus and to hear His well done, good and faithful servant. And by the grace of God, if we have this focus and this purpose of our lives to serve God and His people, we are given the privilege of doing something significant with our lives. Something that will count. Only one life and it will soon be passed. Only what is done for Christ will last. Or to put it in the words of Corey Tim Boom that I put on the WhatsApp group this morning, the measure of a life after all is not its duration, but its donation. It's how much you give of yourself in service of God and others. Or in the words of John Piper, don't waste your life. <laughs> don't waste it. All right. Once we recognize God's purpose for our lives, then we keep our focus sharp by pursuing excellence as we serve Him, even when the circumstances are difficult and painful. Now here I want to use the example of Joseph from the Old Testament, from Genesis. Do you remember Joseph? In spite of the pain and the difficult circumstances that he always sought, he always sought to serve God. He sought to serve God with excellence in spite of the circumstances that he was put in. You remember how he was taken as a slave to Egypt and he ended up in Potiphar's house as a slave. Does he now say, well, poor old me, pity me, I'm a slave. This is not what, how I imagined my life should turn out. And I'm just going to sit and pout. No, what does, what does Joseph do? He determines by the grace of God to become the best slave he can be. So much so that Potiphar puts him in charge of his whole house. He pursues God's goals for him in the circumstances that God has allowed in his life with excellence. Then the poor guy ends up in a dungeon through no fault of his own, innocently. 
Does he pout? Does he grumble? Does he sit in a corner and bemoan his lot? Joseph becomes the best prisoner he could be. <laughs> so much so that the prisoner, the, the prison guard, the head of the prison guard, puts Joseph in charge of all the other prisoners. You see, suffering is really having anything you don't want or not having the things you do want. And that's a, a good definition of suffering that I got from Elizabeth Elliot. So in spite of all of these circumstances, Joseph serves God in the place he is at with excellence. Maybe tonight you find yourself like Joseph in a place you don't want to be. Maybe tonight you're not where you used to be, but you're also not where you want to be. Or perhaps you find yourself holding a position or having responsibilities that you did not choose for yourself this evening. Again, suffering is having anything you don't want or not having the things you do want. In times like these, it's going to really serve us well to follow the example of Joseph, to forget the past, forgive those who have hurt us, and focus on the present place and time. Looking to God and His grace and expecting Him to work out His good purposes through your circumstances. By determining to be the best we can be wherever we are, each one of us can bloom where we are planted. I took that photograph at Rock Lodge many, many years ago. And a real downtime in my life. That really spoke to me. If that plant can grow there, Carol, then you can flourish where you are now. So where has God placed you? And that's the key. Are you a missionary living in a mud hut? Or are you a widow living in a palatial but empty home? You could be in a rural community of only a few people, little town like Volvis Bay, or you could be in a bustling metropolis of millions. You could be in a time of peace, or you could be in a time of war. It could be COVID lockdown, or it could be COVID not lockdown. Whatever the case may be, wherever he puts us, God has a purpose. Whatever the situation, it is an opportunity to bear fruit for his kingdom. However difficult the present circumstances, he will enable us to accomplish something for him. Right here and now. We, must, we mustn't try and live our Christian lives in the future. When I get there, or when the circumstances change, then I'll serve Christ. No, serve him now. Amy Carmichael put it this way, we need to expose ourselves to the circumstances of his choice for us. Whatever our circumstances, we must choose to focus on God's purpose for us, pursue his will for us, and then strengthened by him, participate in this race that he has called us to run. The race he has marked out for us, Hebrews 12 says. But you know what, ladies, even though it's maybe harder to serve God during difficult and painful circumstances, it's maybe harder to serve God with excellence in those circumstances, <laughs> you know what? So can too much comfort be a distraction and a hindrance. We can become women who merely exist rather than being women who serve God. Content with where we are, we just don't press forward anymore to maturity. And I think that perhaps this is a particular danger of middle age. Anyone else saying amen to that? Paul warns us against resting on past achievements or present comfort 
and rather to purposefully look ahead, to reach forward, to continue in the race, to discover a deeper faith in God. And for that kind of growth to occur, ladies, we, we all need some kind of tension in our lives. We need a challenge. We need some healthy, productive tension, which comes from setting goals with God's guidance and from our decision to be the best we can be for Him in the circumstances we are in. Too much comfort can invite us to watch the race from the sidelines rather than energetically participating in it. And I think that is why we need to praise and thank God for trials. It's why James says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you fall into various kinds of trials. Why? Because it leads to perseverance. It gives us the perseverance we need to see the race to the end. It gives us that little bit of tension that we need in our lives to keep us wholly dependent on the Lord, constantly straining towards Him. Someone has described the paralyzing effect of comfort this way. Comfort, that stealthy thing that enters the house as guest, and then becomes a host, and then master. Aye, and it becomes a tamer, and with hook and scourge makes puppets of your larger desires. Though its hands are silken, its heart is of iron. Verily, the lust for comfort murders the passion of the soul. And then walks grinning to the funeral. Isn't that a lovely picture? Comfort murders the passion of the soul and then grins and smiles all the way to the funeral. Now, ladies, this is very true. And it's one thing to applaud this truth and to recognize it as the truth, but really it's quite another thing to turn from that lust for comfort that murders the passion of the soul. It's really going to require a disciplined fight. And I say to you, really, Especially with middle age, where you start finding that you just don't have the same energy you used to have. And I think lockdown hasn't helped. So there's a battle that we're going to have to fight. When we choose to forget the past, as we've defined forgetting, when we seek God's purpose in our life, and we decide to be the best for Him wherever we are, we will be very focused people. And focus is essential to running the race. But I'm telling you, ladies, it is not going to come easily. Now, you just take one example. And I'm going to speak here from personal experience tonight. Think of the example of finding or making time to read your Bible and meet with the Lord. What happens? Man, Suddenly, you think of all the things you need to do. You guys sit down to read your Bible, and suddenly you remember all the things you need to do. Not just for today, but you know what? For the rest of your life. <laughs> and so what do you have to do? You have to fight the urge to get up and move the clothes from the washing machine to the wash line. Because, you know, we've still got sunshine at the moment. And it's going to be a battle to focus your mind and your heart on reading the Bible and prayer. You're going to think of that person you need to call. And then you reach for your phone. And now that we have these things right with us and even reading the Bible on them, my goodness how much more difficult it's become. Or you sit there and you're about to start reading the Bible and you look up and you see... That curtain isn't hanging quite straight. And then you think, no, no, no. Oh, let me just quickly fix the curtain. And then it's two minutes to fix the curtain. And you sit down. Okay. You see what I'm saying? Did, am I the only one? No. Ah, you have to go to war with yourself. And you're going to have to have a conversation with yourself like, no, I will write that down and do it later. I really have to write it down because if I don't write it down nowadays, I really do forget to do it later. I'm going to read my Bible. Or no, I'll call her later. I am going to read my Bible. 
or no, I can switch my phone onto silent and let voicemail take the call. I don't need this pressure right now. I'm going to read my Bible. I'll write that email later. I will hang the clothes on the wash line later. I'll load the dishwasher later. I'll make the bed later. I'll call that repairman or that home affairs office or an artist <laughs> later. I'm going to read my Bible. <laughs> and we're going to feel like it's a battle. Why, ladies? Is it because you're unspiritual? No. Because we have an ancient foe who seeks to work us woe. His craft and power are great and armed with cruel hate on earth is not his equal. Connie said it jokingly the other day, but it's very true. One of the best ways to fall asleep at night if you battle with insomnia is to take this sleeping pill. You pick this book up, the devil will put you to sleep. It's a spiritual fight. But we don't fight this battle alone, do we? That old song I just quoted, The Mighty Fortress is Our God, goes on to say, Did we in our own strength confide, our striving would be losing. Were not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing? Dost ask who that may be? Christ Jesus, it is he. Lord Sabaoth, his name from age to age the same. And he must win the battle. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. And what little word? Take it to the Lord in prayer. Confess to the Lord. Lord, I'm battling to concentrate. Lord, I really want to meet with you. Please take my thoughts and help me to focus right now. Just take it to the Lord. Quote the scripture. Send the devil packing. <laughs> but fight! Don't let Satan tell you that you that unless you have a quiet time that is fireworks and this amazing experience of closeness with the Lord that you're wasting your time, might as well not even try. Don't let him let you fall into that trap. Here is where God speaks. You read this. You look for promises. You look for warnings. You look for commands to obey. You look for God's word for you for today. And even if there's no sparks and no fireworks, it's okay. God has met with you through his word. We can ask God to clear our minds and to enable us to receive the grace and love we need from him to go through the day loving him, serving him, and focused on his purpose for our lives. Ladies, when we run the race, there are going to be lots of voices calling for us to abandon the effort. And some of them are going to be more persistent and more difficult to resist than the ones I've just mentioned. The world is constantly going to try and turn us away from following Christ. We will feel the pressure to be well thought of by those who make demands on our lives. We'll feel the pressure to be like people in the neighborhood or to be like people in the school or, or in the office. And we, and we aren't always given the praise from the world when we strive after God's goals for us. The world doesn't understand what we're busy with. The past will hold us a prisoner, chained and bound to darker days and deeds, our flesh, our sinful flesh, will call us to have fun, to take it easy, not to worry. You can do it tomorrow. The world doesn't understand our race or the prize that we're aiming for. It doesn't acknowledge the cause of Christ or value the commitment that is called for. You'll be thought of as being narrow-minded or fanatical or naive if you live this kind of single-minded life? And how often will the devil not use that smile, that smirk from people in the world 
to test your resolve to live a focused life. That's when it's going to be good to remember that a single-minded life that accomplishes something is far better than a scattered life that accomplishes little. Amy Carmichael puts it this way. She says, better a thousand times effective peculiarity than ineffective ordinariness. But despite all these voices, the runner who is looking ahead and reaching forward has ears for only one voice. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. The runner clearly hears God's strong voice over the weaker but persistent voices of the world that are calling us all the time to lesser pursuits and duller prizes. God's word calls us to look ahead, to determine our God-given purpose, to set our sights on the goals he gives us, and to be the best we can be for him to daily fix our heart and mind on God himself and to direct our focus forward every minute. In fact, his voice trumpets his main purpose for our lives in Matthew 6 verse 33. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Then all these other things will be added to you. But what do we do? <laughs> we seek everything else first. And then we give God the leftovers of our time and our resources. Which voice are you following this evening? Now I want to close this evening by <clears throat> just reading to you an amazing little uh, article really written by a lady called Lilius Trotter, Isabella Lilius Trotter. She was a missionary to the Arabs of Algeria, North Africa. She lives, lived the same time as Amy Carmichael, and they actually com communicated with one another. They, they corresponded. Um, there is a really good um, main biography of her life, which we used to have on the book table, but I think someone must have bought it, called A Passion for the Impossible by Miriam Huffman uh, Rockness. Um, I got to know about Lilius Trotter. I'd never heard of her and I got to know about her from the little book of biographies of ladies, Extraordinary Woman by Noel Piper, John Piper's wife. And in there she deals with her life. And I was so intrigued by this woman that I then went out and got this biography and got everything else I could find written by Lilius Trotter. Lelia Strotter was an extremely accomplished artist. So much so that she was recognized by uh, John Ruskin, one of the great artists and art critics of the day in the Victorian era, as having the potential to have an amazing art career. And the temptation was there for her to pursue a career in art, but instead, because she knew Jesus Christ and his purpose for her life was, was the, the purpose for which she was straining forward. She laid aside her career in art and instead began to pursue uh, a career, a, a, a missionary calling. And she ended up in Algeria. Amazingly, as it always is with all the things we give up for Jesus, he even used her artistic ability in service of the kingdom of God. She wrote a number of different uh, gospel tracts, beautifully illustrated, because she realized that the Arab mind loved beauty and that they were more inclined to read the gospel tract if it had these beautiful drawings with it. And, and many of her things are still available on the internet. Go and look for yourself. One of the little leaflets she wrote was this little book called Focused. And we'll see why it is called a story and a song in a moment. A very well-known modern chorus that we sing was based on this leaflet by Lilia Strotter called Focused. So, it is called The Lesson of the, of the Dandelion, and I'm going to read it to you. Hopefully help you stay awake by looking at some pictures. She says, it was in a wood in early morning 
The sun was climbing behind a steep cliff in the east, and its light was flooding nearer and nearer, and then making pools among uh, the trees. Suddenly, from a dark corner of purple-brown stems and tawny moss, there shone out a great golden star. It was just a dandelion and half withered, but it was full face to the sun and had caught into its heart all the glory it could hold and was shining so radiantly that the dew that lay on it still made a perfect aureole, a, a halo around its head. And it seemed to talk standing there to talk about the possibility of making the very best of these lives of ours. Now, if you read anything by Lilia Strotter, you'll know that she loved to look for the spiritual in the shadows of the physical. You can go and look at some of her, her writings to see that. She says, For if the sun of righteousness has risen on our hearts, there is an ocean of grace and love and power lying all around us, an ocean to which all earthly light is but a drop, and it is ready to transfigure us as the sunshine transfigured the dandelion, and on the same condition that we stand full face to God. Gathered up, focused lives, intent on one aim, Christ, these are the lives which God can, on which God can concentrate blessedness. It is all for all by a law as unvarying as any law that governs the material universe. We see the principle shadowed in the trend of science, the telephone and the wireless in the realm of sound, the use of radium and ultraviolet light in the realm of light. All of these work by gathering into focus currents and waves that, dispersed, don't serve us. In every branch of learning and workmanship, the tendency of these days is to specialize, to take up one point and to follow it to the uttermost. And Satan knows well the power of concentration. If a soul is likely to get under the sway of the inspiration, this one thing I do, he will turn all his energies to bring in side interests that will shatter that gathering intensity. And they lie all around these interests. It's never been so easy to live in half a dozen good harmless worlds at once. Art, music, social science, games, motoring, the following of some profession and so on. And between them we run the risk of drifting about. The good hiding the best even more effectually than it could be hidden by downright frivolity with its smothered heartache and its own emptiness. It's easy to find out whether our lives are focused. And if so, where the focus lies, how do we know? Where do our thoughts settle when consciousness comes back in the morning? Where do they swing back when the pressure is off during the day? Does this test not give the clue? Then dare to have it out with God. And after all, that's the shortest way. Dare to lay bare your whole life and your being before him and ask him to show you whether or not it is all focused on Christ and his glory. Dare to face the fact that unfocused, good and useful as it may seem, your life will prove to have failed of its purpose. What does this focusing mean? Study the matter and you will see it means two things. Gathering in all that can be gathered and letting the rest drop. The working of any lens, microscope, telescope, camera, they will show you this. In fact, the lens of your own eye in a room where you are sitting will teach you this as clearly as any other. If you look at the window bars, <clears throat> the beyond is only shadow. If you look through the window bars at the distance, then the bars turn into ghosts. 
You have to choose what you will fix your gaze upon and let the other go. <coughs> Are we ready for a cleavage to be wrought through the whole range of our lives? Like that division long ago at the taking of Jericho? The division between the things that could be passed through the fire of consecration into the treasury of the Lord and the things that are unable to buy the fire to be destroyed. All aims, all ambitions, all desires, all pursuits, shall we dare to drop them if they cannot be gathered sharply and clearly into the focus of this one thing I do? Won't it make life narrow, this focusing? In a sense, it will. Just like the mountain path grows narrower, for it matters more and more the higher we go where we set our feet. But there is always, as it narrows, a wider and wider outlook and purer, clearer air. Narrow as Christ's life was narrow. That's our aim. Narrow as regards self-seeking, but broad as the love of God to all around. Is there any fear in that? And in the narrowing and the focusing, the channel will be prepared for God's power. Like the stream hemmed between rock beds that wells up in a spring. Or like the burning glass that gathers the rays into an intensity that will kindle fire. It is worthwhile to let God see what he can do with these lives of ours, if to live is Christ. How do we bring things into focus in the world of optics? Not by looking at the things to be dropped, but by looking at the one thing that must be pointed out or be brought out. And then here is the sentence on which that famous chorus or hymn was based. Turn full your soul's vision to Jesus and look and look at him and a strange dimness will come over all that is apart from him. And the divine atre, I hope I've pronounced the French word correctly, it means desire or attraction or allurement or charm. The divine charm or attraction by which God's saints are made, even in this 20th century, will lay hold of you. For he is worthy to have all there is to be had in the heart that he has died to win. 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18 puts it this way, And we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. As we turn our soul's gaze full on to the sun of righteousness, we will also shine like that dandelion. Our lives will be transformed. Are you running, ladies? Are you focusing on this God-given purpose? There are lots of discouraging voices. Satan is there. And that's why Hebrews says, throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and run with perseverance, the race marked out for us. Maybe we need to take an inventory tonight of the things that are keeping us from giving our whole heart to the race. And by God's grace, determine to lay aside the useless and the wasteful and the meaningless and the unimportant things that can clutter our lives in order that we can be the kind of focused woman that God has called us to be. As we draw on His strength, to focus our energies on reaching his goals for our lives. Hebrews 12 says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Any one of you ladies want to take a guess at which song that 
was based on that uh, article by Lilia Strotter? Yes, very good. It was written by Helen Lemmel after she read this article, this leaflet by Lilia Strotter. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. On the WhatsApp just now, I will send you two links. A link to the story behind the song and a link to a documentary about the life of Lilia Strotter, if you're interested. Well, I hope I haven't discouraged you this evening because honestly, if I had heard tonight's message this morning when I was crawling, <laughs> I, would have, I would have experienced it as a burden. I trust that it wouldn't have been a burden, but that it will be an encouragement to strain forward with the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ to what lies ahead. Let's pray together. Lord, this evening as we close our time together, we want to pray in the words of that old hymn, Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart, naught be all else to me save that thou art. Thou my best thought, by day or by night, Waking or sleeping, thy presence, my light. Be thou my wisdom, thou my true word. I ever with thee and thou with me, Lord. Thou my great father and I thy true son, thy true daughter. Thou in me dwelling <clears throat> and I with thee one. Lord, riches I heed not, nor man's empty praise. Thou mine inheritance now and always. Thou and thou only first in my heart. High King of heaven, my treasure thou art. High King of heaven, after victory won, may I reach heaven's joys, O bright morning sun. Heart of my own heart, whatever befall, still be my vision, O ruler of all. Amen.